it took me a little while to get into the Christmas groove, Christmas spirit, but uh, I've gotten there. Uh, I, I, I haven't gotten there because uh, I've done a lot of shopping. Uh, I haven't gotten there because I've uh, perfectly decorated all my part of the house. Uh, and I haven't gotten there because I've had a lot of time to do the kind of stretch out in the living room on the floor with the kids and look at the twinkly, squint your eyes, look at the twinkly lights at three. Um, I think I've just gotten there because the time of the year just keeps pushing forward. And you begin to see more and more all around. Everything's happening. Programs are taking place. It's sort of the the sound and smell and look of Christmas is beginning to be everywhere. And so it's kind of hard to avoid, kind of hard to look the other way. I, I have this kind of resistance factor whenever I start seeing Christmas trees put up in stores in uh, mid-October or right after Halloween or whatever. I'm kind of get this, like I'm going around like, no, 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 no. Don't bring that to me. Don't do that. Not because I'm against Christmas. It's just, I'd like to smell a little bit of the autumn and you know the leaves burning and some things like that a little bit before we go to the Christmas tree. But now we're on. We're on. It's coming at us. It's full force. It's the last week of school this, this, this week. And, uh, and, and, and so the programs are rolling. The Christmas parties are happening. Everything's going full speed. And, and so I've kind of gotten caught in the vortex of that. And I'm just kind of going along and I'm enjoying the sights and the sounds and the smells of, of Christmas. Uh, I'm not quite yet to where I listen to Christmas music nonstop, but it's okay to throw one in every hour or two, and that kind of thing. You know, it, it, here's the problem with listening to it nonstop. And if you do, that's really awesome. There's a lot of really awesome Christmas music, music but what happens is they play all the awesome ones and then they have to start with the not so awesome ones. And it's like, um, you know, you could have probably recorded that in your basement and been about the same quality as what that one is. And so this comes a point where it's like, I, I want to just give it to me in doses along the way and I'm good. So the Christmas cheer thing, I, I'm really beginning to feel it. It's hitting. It's like, and, and, and part of my excitement in being here today is like, man, we're, 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 we're in the Christmas flow. I mean, tonight we're going to have a program that you're going to love. Um, we're going to have food that's delicious. It's just going to be just what Christmas is about as far as some of the traditions and some of the, some of the extra pieces that go along with it. But I want to tell you, all of this stuff and all of the things that happen leading up to Christmas would never take place if it wasn't for a little baby that was born in Bethlehem on a, on a, on a starlit night in a stable where animals were gathered around and, uh, and, and, and who entered this world in one of the most humble and seemingly insignificant ways, but he came as the one, as Tim said earlier in his prayer, he split history in two. He's the name above every name, if you follow him. He's the name that divides people. He's the name that will cause people to rise up in worship and to, and, to, and to rise up almost in war, so to speak. And so there's nothing neutral about this baby. And the reason he's not neutral is because he's the son of God, the living one, the one who came to save the world and all the people of the world from their sins. Now, here's, I'm going to talk about a downside of Christmas before I bring you to the hope. And the downside of Christmas is this, is this. When we start having those feelings, those warm feelings, you smell, you know, I think B&G has done two um, cookie exchanges or something. I think there was one here last night, I believe. Some of you ladies, um, I thought some of the guys were smiling better or something this morning. They had some cookies when they got home. I don't know. But anyway, there was a cookie exchange that took place, I believe, here last night. And then uh, there was one in our neighborhood that she went to and you know, and start, you start smelling the cookies baking. You start seeing the different cookies coming around. Ones you don't see all year round, but all of a sudden you start seeing them at Christmas time. And, uh, and, and, and so when all the sights, the sounds, the activities, all, what that does for most of us is it begins to prompt our memory bank. 
And so it sets into motion memories that we've built up over a lifetime. And most of those memories are wonderful memories. And they're, and they're memories that we love and we cherish and we think back to some of the Christmases we had and some of the things that you know, really caused us to really enjoy the season and maybe kind of kicked it up a little notch and, 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 and made it even more special because of some of the people we celebrated with, because of some of the, kind of the gifts that we either gave or we received over the years, some of the uh, significant kinds of activities that we got involved in. I, I believe I saw something very briefly. I don't know enough about it to really speak to it but where Dave Cadden took a group, a small group or something, into Walmart singing uh, Christmas carols. And the best I could tell, it looked like he was getting kicked out of there. So I don't know what, you know, so you don't know. You, those are memories, though, you know? Like, I mean, how many, how many, how many you know, where did, what have you done in Christmas? Those memories. So those, are, those kids that were in that group, they'll never forget that, Dave. They'll never forget that this Christmas, you know? Hey, what did you guys do? Well, we went caroling in Walmart, and we got kicked out, you know? And, uh, and so... Uh, you know, it's, it's, you, you know, everybody can't enjoy your joy always. That's okay, but you build memories. But when we do that, here's something that happens. Life changes, life goes on. We, we have losses in our lives. And so not only do the memories bring up all the wonderful and good memories that we have from our childhood and from our grown-up years and with our children and then maybe some with our grandchildren and those kind of things, but it also reminds us of some of the losses that we've experienced in life some of the hardships that we've gone through. And so Christmas not only is this joyous, cheerful occasion, because it is and should be that, because of what it is celebrating, but it also is a time that can bring to our hearts, bring to our minds, some memories of people who have gone before, of situations that are no longer there, of losses that we have occurred in our, that have occurred in our life that have been less than positive. So what, what do we do with that? Are we going to let it ruin our Christmas cheer? Are we going to let it um, cause us to kind of mournfully go through a Christmas? Or how do we honestly cope with that or deal with that in such a way that we, we actually come out the other side of it, not having ignored that or buried that loss, but have acknowledged it and yet have still been able to find celebration in this time, in this place in our lives. And so um, I would like to encourage you to know and understand that everybody here, and just even though we're not a massive church by any means, we're large enough to know that there is a, uh, there's plenty of loss that's occurred within this congregation in, in, in the last year, and in particular even the last years, plenty of loss. And, and uh, you say, well, Rod, I saw the title and it said hope. I'm starting to get a little depressed and discouraged. Well, hang with me. We're going to come back out of that, okay? But I've got to take you here first because if you have a sustained loss in your life, you'll be reminded of it in this Christmas season if you haven't already been reminded of it. I just want to tell you that whatever losses you have occurred, first of all, God knows about those losses. He's aware of them as acutely as you are. There's one time when I was just in a very, very hard time with my adult son, and I remember someone looking at me and saying, here's what I want you to remember. God loves your son more than you do. And I thought, wow, that is, I need to hold on to that. I need to remember that. And so whatever loss you have occurred, God cares about that as deeply and even more deeply than you do. If you think about when your child goes through something harsh or something hard, their little heart is broken. There's something within most of us that's broken a little deeper at a little deeper place because we have understanding, we have depth of knowledge, we have a capacity to understand what that pain can really do and what it can really mean to that child. God, our Heavenly Father, knows about these losses, these pains in our lives, and he's deeply aware of them. I also would like to say that you're here today and you're here for a reason. And you're not here to, uh, have to give up because of the losses in life. You're here to move on in spite of the losses in your life. And, and so I would like to uh, give you a phrase. You can write it down or you can just remember it however you want to. I'll give you a phrase. Every week I'm going to give you a phrase. Uh, and, and, and the last week was about certainly not, um, not, not focusing on lesser things but, but on, on, on Jesus this one is, I will not dwell 
on what is lost. I will not dwell on what is lost. I will build on what remains. I will not dwell on what is lost. I will build on what remains. And so it's critical for us to acknowledge what loss we've experienced. But it's also critical for us to take the position of saying, I am here in, in, in spite of this loss, in spite of what, I, what has been taken away from me, I am going to build on what remains. You know, Jesus was prophesied about multiple times in the Old Testament. And hundreds of years before he came, very accurate and specific things were stated about him that all came true. And, uh, and there's over, well over 300 of those prophecies. Some of them are major statements about him. Some of them are kind of innuendo statements. You kind of have to look into some people may agree or disagree with about him. But in most cases, people agree there's well over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that refer to Jesus and his coming that, um, that were fulfilled accurately. And so uh, what we find is over the years, the children of Israel, as they became God's chosen people, and they were the people who God was going to work through, and he was going to do great things through, really the main and most significant thing God was going to do through them, there were two things that he desired to do. One, he could fulfill. The other was very dependent upon them. And that was he wanted them, before they got an earthly king, to, to have a, such a relationship with him that they would interact with him as his people and they would be different than the other governments of the world and that they would be following God. It would just be a, 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 a nation that truly followed God to have this relationship. And, and that's the relationship he wants with all of us. Uh, and so he's still desiring that for any who will enter into that relationship, that you live your life with an allegiance to him first and foremost, and you follow him. That was one of the things that he set apart Israel for. The other was that his promise of a Messiah was to come through this nation of Israel. And so people throughout history, up to the birth of Jesus, were looking for this Messiah. He had heard about it. They'd, 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 there were times when the Israelites were taken into captivity, and then they came back, taken into captivity and came back. But one of the, one of the critical prophecies that kept talking about was that there would be a great deliverer, one who would redeem them. And it was specific, redeem them from their sins. Oftentimes, they looked for someone who would set up a government on earth. And, um, and, and even some of the people around Jesus when he was on earth, that's what they were following him for. We think he can throw back the Roman Empire and he can set up this kingdom on earth that we're, that we're longing for. But that wasn't the kind of Messiah Jesus was. He was the Messiah. He was an eternal Messiah. He's a Messiah to set up the kingdom of God that will live forever, not just an earthly kingdom for a season of time. And so uh, throughout Scripture, you'll see Isaiah is one of those prophets, and we're going to look at him in, just a, in, a, in a few minutes, uh, who, who often spoke of the coming of Jesus, even though he was writing these things hundreds of years before Jesus would come. And uh, I would like to say this, that in the context of losing things, Oftentimes, we are made more aware of and, and more acute of the rescue that, God, that, that we need. When we are in a time of loss, we're more aware of the need for a rescue. Um, if you have an accident and you're injured, it sounds like music for the sirens to be coming to you. Because it sounds like help is on the way. You're going to be rescued. If you're just driving to work in traffic, the sirens sound like a nuisance. But if you're at a point of need, they sound like help is on the way. And so God, oftentimes in our point of greatest loss in life, reminds us that there is a hope beyond this life and beyond this world. And it's demonstrated in the person in the context of Jesus Christ and what he came to do, not only to set us free from the guilt of our sins on this earth, but to create for us a place with God for eternity, forever. And so this gift of a Savior. Now, whenever we lose things, we all have different kinds of reactions. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I tend not to lose a lot of things. 
people in here know me real well? Am I, I don't know. Maybe I should have had, done a survey. I'm thinking, maybe I do. I don't know. I, I don't think I go around losing, like things like my wallet and my keys, I tend not to lose those very much. I may forget them sometimes, but I still know where they are, you know. Uh, and, and so, and, and my phone too. It's like, I'm always pretty good. I've, I've been visiting in prison before, and so you're not allowed to take anything in prison except your license and your key. And so you turn those in, and you go in, and I've gotten up to leave prison before and just felt and realized my wallet was gone. And I have a panic all of a sudden, like, oh, I lost my wallet. Like, no, oh, no, it's in the car, you know. Uh, I mean, it's it just, I don't, I, I'm pretty careful to make sure I've got it on me. But I did have an incident this week. I have a, we, our family, we have a dog. Um, and uh, her name is Savannah. And she's a yellow lab. And she's a full-blooded lab. Uh, she's like a lab in every way. She looks the whole deal, everything else. And she's five years old now, so she's calmed down a lot and everything. Still, our and I'll get out, but she's still calmed down a lot. But um, if I'm doing like this stuff or whatever, she's the kind of dog I can put her in the back of the pickup and uh, I can leave her any place. I go to the hospital, visit people, leave her in the back truck. She's not going any place. She's right there. Uh, her only interest is, is when I'm coming back. She's sitting there, you know, like looking for that. And, and, and she likes to scare people, too. She would not bite them, but she likes to make them think she would. So I park at a distance so people aren't coming right up against her because she'll, I, I had someone the other day who, was, who kept, they were, they were working nearby where I had her uh, with me, and they, and they, they said, uh, does she bite? And I said, well, she, she hasn't really ever. I don't think she would or something. And, and I said, okay, you know, whatever. And they came back two or three times to look at her, and they said, um, I I think she'd bite. The way she's, every time I come up here, the way she's acting, I think she'd bite. I said, well, you can go see if you want to. I don't think she will. But anyway, um, so she, she got, she's kind of a little more feisty than most uh, Labradors we've had in the past because uh, our fourth one. And, uh, but I had to meet somebody. Now, most of the time, if she's going to ride with me, she's got to ride in the back of the truck. She's going to ride it. But, you know, it's a little bit cold right now. So every once in a while, I have mercy and let her ride up front. And, uh, and so... I had to meet somebody, and so she had, it was early in the morning, and she, I'd let her ride up front, and so she was sitting up there, I thought, well, I'm just going to leave her in there while I meet with them, and uh, so I, I went and had my meeting, I was close by, close by the truck, had my meeting, it ended up taking longer than I thought, it was there about two hours, and uh, end up uh, realizing at some point, went, my wallet, where's my wallet? And it struck me, I'm going, oh yeah, you drove through, where did I drive through? Oh, Dunkin' Donuts, yeah. It's like just seeing if I could rem remember where I drove through that morning to get a cup of coffee. I, I drove through Dunkin' Donuts to get a cup of coffee, and I laid my wallet beside me on the seat. And it kind of, once I realized that, I'm going, I probably ought to check on that. I mean, Savannah's in there with that wallet. I don't, you know, like, oh, that's silly. She, I mean, what she want a wallet for? Well, I shook hands with the gentleman. He walked away, and I walked over to the truck, opened the door, and dollar bills. <laughs> I'm like, what? I looked at her and I said, get over there right now. Sit down. Like, get on there. She's looking at me like, what happened to him, you know? I looked down. Now, I, I you know, we do the Dave Ramsey thing in, in just about every way we do. And so I had taken the food money and had it in my wallet for the week. So I had a $100 bill in there and I had some other denomination, whatever. But I also had some ones and a 10 and a 5. Well, guess what? The $100 bill was ripped right in two. And I only saw half of it. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm not following you around. <laughs> but you better not have eaten this thing. And so I'm kind of scrambling. I mean, the, this one side looked crisp and nice. And it was one of the newer ones, you know. And I'm, you know, and then I'm seeing uh, uh, two pieces of a twenty, and the five and the ten, perfect, sitting there, perfect, nothing wrong with them. The ones, nothing wrong with them whatsoever. They're just sitting there. The wallet's sitting there like it had never been bothered, but all the just the just the cash, the, the bills were out. I don't know how in the world she got it open, pulled those things out, but she, however she did, she did. And so I'm I'm kind of searching around in there, and finally stuck down in between. You see, I pulled up that other half of a hundred. It was 
not chewed up or anything, just like she tore it in half. I said, this, she has only a mouth. I don't know how she tore these bills in half, but I had three bills just neatly torn in half, just like, just like that. And I'm thinking, okay, if these are a total, girl, you're up for sale. I'll get my money back from you. That's what I'm going to do. So we had some serious talking going on. It was one-sided. And she was sitting over there like she just lost her best friend, you know? And, uh, you know, but in that moment, that felt like a loss, you know? Like, man, dumb dog. Here I am being nice to her, letting her ride around with me some, you know? And, and you know, and, and, and look what she did. You know, I just ticked off. Some point... Later in the day, Benji said, did it ruin your day? I said, no, it didn't ruin my day. It ruined about 15 minutes of it real good. But I'm not going to let it ruin my day. That's not, that's, and, and anyway, I haven't taken my taped dollars back to the bank, but I think I'll get my money back from them. It'd be just fine. You, anybody want to tape the $100 bill, $100 bill? You can see me after service. We'll work out an arrangement here, okay? Um, but in a moment, we can feel that impact of a loss like, oh, man. How did this happen? So how do we, how do we deal with that? I, I know that's very lighthearted compared to a lot of losses that we could talk about here. Let me just, I hate to even try to categorize, but let me just mention a few. Some people have dealt with a loss in a relationship. It can be through death. It can be through divorce. It can be through a relationship that never came to be as it seemed like it was going to. Um, loss in opportunities. And the bad thing about opportunities is if we don't take the opportunity, we sometimes never know what we might have had or might have experienced from that. But we, our, ten, our, man, our imagination tends to make us think it might have been better than even it would have been. So it, it, that loss feels very, very strong. And for some people, it seems like loss just sort of leaks out of your life. And then for others, it seems like it just pours. It just pours. We have those moments where it's real heavy. Um, money. Sometimes it's a loss of money. You know, back in 2008, an awful lot of people, their house values just went down. Money was like immediately lost in that. And, uh, and, and then retirement funds were affected. And, you know, Tom's encouraged us over and over again, don't panic in those moments. Just hang in there and stick with it uh, because history is, is on your side. But if you're right at the retirement age and, you, you know, and that money drops like that, it, 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 it's a loss. However you want to cut it, it's a loss. Health. You know, we, you know, one of the things that I've realized as I get older, you better appreciate your health, whatever health you have, and, and because, because health, health won't stay with us forever. And uh, some, uh, some here today struggling with some health issues, you know, and, and, uh, and, and that can feel like a loss to us. Um, you know, and, and then we, we have losses just because we've been stupid, you know, we've been lived in Stupidville or something, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard. Sometimes people want to either blame God for all the losses or blame the devil for all the losses. Sometimes we just have to flat out blame ourselves. I mean, God didn't make you, you know, get that timeshare, nor did the devil, you know? Anyway, I just threw, I'd throw that in in case that, that shoe fit anywhere. But, um, um, and, the, and then the devil does try to steal and kill and destroy. He, he is out to try to take as much as he can away from us. And so he, he, that, that has its effect too. And, uh, God allowed Satan to kind of take Job down to the bare essentials of life. And we don't understand that always. We don't always know uh, what to do with that. It's a loss. There's loss. Um, and then after we experience a loss, there's grief that sets in. Some people can't sleep uh, because of their grief they experience or feel. Other people end up sleeping all the time. That's all they do is just stay in bed. Some people can't eat. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and then other people, all they want to do is just eat all the time. Uh, that's how they deal with it. And then some people won't talk, and then other people, all they can do is talk about it. And so we have different reactions, different things, but we all experience these things. And so what I want to do today is give you a Christmas lesson in three words that I believe can help us look past the losses, not ignore them, not deny them, but look past the losses and see what Jesus wants to do this Christmas in our lives to help us not to be brought down by the circumstances of our lives and by the losses that we've occurred, but for us to actually build on what remains. I will not dwell on what is lost. Doesn't mean I'm not aware of it. Doesn't mean that I don't give a certain amount of attention to it and focus and allow grief to be real and true, but, there, but I'm not going to stay there. I am going to build 
on what remains. So the first word, if you'll grab your outline uh, beside you, uh, it's a simple, simple outline, a lot of scripture. And we're going to kind of uh, peel through the scripture because uh, it, it gives us the, the backdrop to the words. The first word is behold. Behold. Let me read this scripture to you from Luke chapter 2 out of the Christmas story. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, and I'm going to have to just tell you this, all the scripture today is in King James Version. So if you get a little lost in the these and nows and whatever, that's okay. I, I, I went through it because of some of the language that's used that I wanted to use today for emphasis, okay? Uh, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. That means very afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Let's back up there a minute. Angel said unto them, Fear not, for what? Behold. 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 Do you use that word very often? Do you walk into some place and go, Hey, behold. What? Behold. I'm saying behold. It's, you know, what, is, what does this mean? Well, look and see. Look and see. It's like we go, come here, i got to show you something. Come here, hey, get over here. Look at this. you got to watch this little video on, the, on my phone here. You know, come and see it. Come and see it. So the next time, I'm just going to listen to a little old English during Christmas this year, okay? So the next time you want to show someone, you're saying, come here and see this, I want you to walk in and go, hey, behold, behold. If they look at you funny, that's okay. Make them figure it out, you know? It's a great word. It has a lot of umph, a lot of emphasis to it. And so in the scripture, the angel's coming and he says, hey, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. We're going to come back to that word, okay, which shall be to all people. Let's go on down through the story. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. When they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which it were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And as the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them, that they had beheld. Beheld. I want to just speak to you a moment on this word. The very first thing I want you to do in the midst of whatever challenge or circumstance or difficulty or loss you've experienced in this Christmas time or in past Christmas time or in past times that might kind of come in haunt you in this is behold. What are you supposed to behold? What are you supposed to come and see? You're supposed to see that a Savior has been born. God has come and is present with us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. You may still have the same set of circumstances, but if you behold, what you realize is that in the midst of those circumstances, God has arrived. He has come. Come and see that God is present He's present in your world. There may be somebody missing at your table this year. There may be some other losses we talked about here or other things that may not be in place that were in place last year. You may not be able to do Christmas the way you've done it before. But remember, Christmas is here because God came so we could behold him. We could come and see the living God. We can know he's real. We can know he's present. He's in our circumstances. See, when God came to earth through the person of Jesus Christ, he didn't come 
in a perfect way, and he didn't come to a perfect world. He didn't come to perfect people. Everything in our world system was broken, and he came at a very harsh time, and he was born in a very harsh environment. But you know what? That's the way God is. He still comes. You say, yeah, but if you only knew my circumstances, but if you only knew what I've experienced, if you only knew what I've gone through, if you only knew what, what, what life has handed me. And I probably don't know. But what I do know is that we should behold the God of the universe came to earth to you and to me, not how we should be, not how we should have been, not because we had it all together, not because everything had gone right in our life, not because we were born into the right family, not because we had the right pedigree or anything else, but because he loved us. So right now in your circumstances, whatever they are, I want you to behold the Savior. Behold the presence of God in your situation. Remember that he's an ever-present help in time of trouble. And, and here's something that is hard to, to grapple with, but I beg you to do it. And that is to stay in the dark until your eyes adjust and you can see God has come into your situation. You know how it is when you walk into a dark room and it's totally dark and you just can't see anything? If you stand still long enough, you start making out some things. You can start seeing a little bit. I want you to stay put long enough to see God is with you. Behold, come and see. God has become present to you. That's what Christmas is. God became present. The Savior of the world appeared. The angels couldn't keep it. Heaven could not. It had to overflow. So some shepherd guys that were out there on the field seemingly just... The, the last people on last person on people's minds and, and, and as they were going through life. But God's going, we're going to tell them. We can't help it. And so they just spread it out and said, hey, behold, good news. Savior's been born. And, and, and you'll go, you can go find him. You can come and see. In the dark of their night, God showed up. And I want to tell you that's what Christmas is. Behold, Jesus is present in your life, right where you are, right now, if you're willing to see him. You ever heard the expression, lo and behold? Lo and behold? You know, a lot of times you'll hear it in certain kinds of, you know, settings, but it, it isn't a word, it is an expression you'll hear all the time, but it's, it's kind of a, a phrase that has sort of hung on a little bit, old English a little bit, say, you know, you might, you might hear someone say, well, lo and behold, if they didn't just up and do whatever they're going to do, you know, it's lo and behold. And so, I want, I want you to kind of practice that phrase this Christmas, too. Whenever you see something kind of surprise, well, lo and behold, look, if they didn't put up 100,000 Christmas lights on their tree, you know, or on their, around their house or whatever, just, just, to kind of, just to kind of bring yourself back into this behold thing, okay? Behold, God is present. He is real. And so whatever reminds you that God is present, he's real, the lights, the shopping, the traffic, the anything, that God came to earth, he's present. Behold. Oh, well, lo and behold, if it's traffic, this doesn't remind me that Jesus still makes a mess in this world. I mean, he can still tie up a traffic. Look at this. But whatever it is, I'm, you know, you can do it however you want to. I just like to put little prompters in our brain to say, hey, remember that Jesus came. Look and see that God has not gone any place. Behold God in your struggle. Behold God in your blessings. Behold God in the midst of your messes. If you look hard enough, I need to tell you God is in your darkness. Not because he dwells in darkness, but because he dwells with people who have to go through darkness. There's a second word I want to share with you. And that is beyond. Beyond. Look at this passage of scripture with me, if you would, on going on down in Luke 2, the Christmas story. And behold, there we are again. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And it came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus, what an appropriate day for us to be looking at this, Stephen Liz, with your new little one here, same uh, kind of arrangement. 
And, and he came uh, by the Spirit when the, when the parents brought in the, in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, verse 28. Then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. Remember, I'm reading King James. According to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. This man's holding this baby. God had promised him he would not die until he had seen the Savior of the world. He knew at that moment he was holding the Savior of the world. And so he could look beyond the baby and he could see the difference that was going to be made. He came as a light to lighten the Gentiles. Do, do you understand how off key that would sound in Jerusalem at this time? Or in, in Israel at this time? He came to make a light for the Gentiles? What are you talking about? And the glory of the people of Israel. So it's interesting, isn't it, that this man could see beyond the moment and see something greater that God's purpose was going to unfold and reveal. And I'm just going to tell you, God has something greater for you than beyond the moment of your loss, your hardship, your difficulty, your memory that makes you sad. God has something beyond that. And, and, and so what you have to do is lift up your head, lift up your eyes, and look beyond your circumstance. You have to, first of all, behold him in your circumstances, or I don't think it'll do much good to look beyond. Because you, you have to own it. You have to be there. You have to accept it. You have to look at it. You have to behold the presence of Jesus in the midst of that. Then you have to look beyond, beyond. And when you look beyond, you see not only does God have some wonderful things in store for you now and in this life, still for purpose and meaning for your life to fulfill while you're here in spite of the losses that have happened, that there is hope beyond, beyond your loss. There's an old song that I remember singing a lot as a kid in church. Or I don't know if I sang it so much, as much as I listened to other people sing it probably. It's called Victory in Jesus. And, uh, and it's interesting. I, I kind of grew up in an environment where it wasn't a Pentecostal church, but there would have been some days you'd have thought it was because people did believe in shouting a little bit. And, uh, and, so, and there were certain things that would seem to make people want to shout more than others. And one of those things was whenever they started singing about heaven. And so in Victory in Jesus, the last song is, I heard about a mansion, heard about those streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. Now, there was a, I, I, a church I grew up in was in South Florida, so there was a pretty strong contingency of retirees there. And some of those folks had lived a long life. They'd seen it all. They, were, they weren't too far from stepping onto those streets of gold. And so you could, they could have just been singing along, Victory in Jesus. They get to that verse, and it was just sort of like a live wire. Someone kind of hit a lightning bolt down through. And they were like, you know, arthritis. They were forgetting about their arthritis or whatever. They were standing up and waving their hands. A couple of them took a walk like Annie or something around a church or, you know, whatever. But they got, they got, they got kind of happy because they knew there was something beyond. Their life was winding down, but there was something beyond. There was a hope. And I heard about a mansion. I heard about those streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. In other words, they're going, man, I'm, I'm starting to see that heavenly shoreline out there. I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking it's not going to be too long. I'm going to make that. I'm going to make that trek. There's a hope beyond your loss. Now, I don't think we have to live this world in such a way that our only hope is what's beyond. But I will tell you this. If we keep in mind how short this life is in comparison to how long eternity is. My brother Rick, he's been here, he's spoken here, he's a pastor in South Florida. He has a lot of health issues, especially related to his heart. And he's had some pretty difficult times in recent uh, months, actually, with regard to his heart, some congestive heart fail failure issues and, uh, that have, that have uh, been pretty tough. And uh, I was talking to him yesterday on the phone, and he has some reports and things that are not really all that great about his heart. And uh, he's going to have to go see another specialist in another part of the state. And, uh, and there's some possible very critical decisions that might have to be made with regard to his heart uh, in the upcoming weeks or months. And, um, and I, I, I was just talking to him, and he was sharing this with me. And, uh, and he said, you know, Rod, he said, I'm at great peace about this. He said, um, I'm 59 years old. And... Um, 
I, I look back across my life and I'm going, wow, this, is, this has been an incredible 59 years. I, I, I really, really have gotten a lot in. I've done a lot. I've seen a lot. There's not a lot really still missing. So, you know, if I live, if 59 was it, I wouldn't have a lot to complain about. And uh, if I did make it to 79 or 89, uh, if they were able to do some things that would uh, extend my life significantly, um, in light of eternity, that all's still pretty short. And I was, and he was talking about how all the blessings that he had, and I felt like he messed, left, left one out. And I said, I think you forgot to mention one of the blessings that you've had in your life. And uh, he said, what was that, Rod? I said, you've had an outstanding younger brother. And anyway, he, he was, uh, but uh, it, it, just trying to lighten up the moment a little bit, you know, there. But the deal was this. When I was talking to him, I thought, you know what? It's so true. Not only, and, and, and none of us want to end life short. We have, we have people, it's, it's, it's not just the loss that we occur. It's a loss that other people occur by our, by our going and so, um, and, and so, we, so we, we, nobody wants that, but here's the deal. The deal is this, that God in this life has something beyond your losses. That's why you're here. He, he also, at the end of this life, has something beyond. That's what Jesus came to do, was to build a bridge for us. And he said, if I go away, I will prepare a place for you so that you can come and be with me. He said, I, I'm, I'm, he not only came to deliver us from our sins, but to make an access to the Father in this world and beyond this world. And so remember, he is in the midst of what you're in. Behold him, the Savior, the God who came to be with us, to reveal himself to us, Jesus Christ. He is beyond. He has a life beyond our current circumstances for us. And let me just say this too. I believe when we know of people who have impacted people greatly, there's always a story behind somebody's glory. There's always pain behind someone's productivity. There's always a pruning behind someone's fruitfulness. And so if you feel like you've experienced that pain, that pruning, if you feel like you, you, you've experienced that hard story, understand those are the very people God often can use in the greatest measure. So don't, don't reject that. Don't get bitter and angry about it. But remember, behold, God is with you in that. He has something beyond it. And now for our last word, which is my favorite word, because it's really three words. It's cheating. It's three words in one. It's nevertheless. Nevertheless. I think it's a word we still do use sometimes, but we don't always, you know, it's not like, an everyday word necessarily, but um, let's look at the scripture. Nevertheless, the dimness, this is from Isaiah, so we're going back to Isaiah, the prophet, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of uh, Nephtala, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. There was a lot of judgment that had gone on with the children of Israel. And uh, Nevertheless, nevertheless, remember that word, we're going on down. It says the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You're familiar with that verse, aren't you? You'll see it all over the place at Christmas time. It was written hundreds of years before Jesus came. He's saying, Israel, you've been through all this. You're going through all this. He's prophesying. He's talking about, he says, nevertheless, nevertheless. 
Do you know that the Bible actually is filled with the word nevertheless? Now, particularly in the King James Version. But I'm going to talk to you about a nevertheless perspective of God in the last couple minutes here. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Ezekiel 16, 60, that God loves us with a nevertheless kind of love. Luke chapter 5, verse 5, Peter and the disciples had been out fishing all night. They came in and Jesus said, how many did you catch? They go, zero. He goes, well, why don't you push out and let's go fishing? And Peter's like, wait, man, we did it all night. I mean, we're like the fishermen. You're the carpenter guy, you know, just take my, you can read the tone in there, definitely a tone of like, Man, do not ask us to do that. We've already been out there all night. But he did say this, nevertheless, since you've requested, since you've asked, we'll go out. You know what happened? They had so many fish, they were about to lose their boats and everything. See, because God created the fish too. He knew where the fish were. It was no mystery to him. He was revealing some things. Peter didn't even want Jesus to be near him at the time. He's going, man, this guy knows everything, everything. But he at least had the kind of obedience that said, even though I don't want to do it, even though I'm tired, nevertheless, I'll push out. We'll go do it. The result was amazing. Job, he said, his wife said, look, you've lost everything. You're a mess. Why don't you just curse God and die? And he's like, man, I, I've taken all this good stuff from God and why would I not receive from him the things that aren't so good? Why would I do that? No, thank you. Nevertheless, I will serve him. Though he slay me, nevertheless, I will serve him. Ruth, whenever she had lost her husband, instead of going back to her people, she said, I'm going to go with you, Naomi, where you go. Your people will be my people. Even though I've lost these things, nevertheless, I'm going to go and build on what remains. Elisha, when Elijah was taken up in a chariot of fire, Eli Elisha, who had been completely mentored by him, was kind of standing there scratching his head and going, now what do we do? And he picked up the cloak, and he did double what Elisha had accomplished in his life. He had a double portion of the blessing of what Elijah had, and Elisha did. And so even though he was standing there what in the world is going on here? Nevertheless, he picked up the cloak and he went ahead and built on what remained and God doubled the impact of his ministry even over the great man Elijah. Martha, her brother was dead and the King James says it so powerfully. Whenever Jesus came, she said he's been dead four days and he stinketh. That's a good King James word too. We need to go back and get some of these words, man. They're powerful. Um, but she also said to Jesus, nevertheless, I, I know that even now you could do something. You can do, you can, you can do, nevertheless, even though this is the case, nevertheless, this. Jesus, when he was guarding the Gethsemane, he said, if you could take this cup away from me. But nevertheless, your will, not mine. Do we have any nevertheless Christians here this morning? Do I have any people who are going, you know what, I've beheld God in the midst of my circumstances. I've been able to look beyond. And even in spite of the fact everything's not exactly the way I want it to be and not exactly the way I hoped it would be, not exactly uh, with the people I wanted to be with and things haven't worked out exactly, nevertheless, I will serve God. I will see God this Christmas. I will worship the risen Savior. I will worship him. And I will I will embrace the fact that he came, Emmanuel, God with us. He is with me right now. And even though everything in my life is not perfect, it is not exactly the way I would have designed it, nevertheless, I will serve the God who came to me. Let's pray.